As we move through chapter two in our Leninger text, we have a few objectives. First, we wanna take a look at the structural properties of water and how those different properties of water can really help to build and alter many of the biomolecules we're gonna discuss throughout this course. We'll then move into a discussion of the ionization of water that will help us with a crash course and review of pH and weak acids. From this, we'll finally end this chapter by looking at how the human body uses a buffering system to maintain blood pH. Before we start discussing water, first let's take a quick review of hydrogen bonding. So as we can see, anytime we're going to be able to form a hydrogen bond that's going to be shown here with these blue dashes, we will need a hydrogen bound to a more electronegative atom. So very often we're going to see this hydrogen that's capable of interacting in hydrogen bonding attached to an oxygen or a nitrogen. So when we see this type of hydrogen bonding, we're going to have an interaction that's going to be considered one portion is our proton donor. So in this example here, we've got a proton donor, and then we'll also have a proton acceptor, which is shown here. And as we continue our discussions today and we start thinking more in the terms of acid and base, we'll still see this same type of hydrogen bonding. We can have proton donors, proton acceptors. So this discussion will continue. So one thing to really keep in mind that very often is missed by students is that anytime you have a carbon to hydrogen bond, this is not going to be capable of that type of hydrogen bonding. The carbon is not going to be a strong enough electronegative atom to really have a pool on the electrons that allows that type of hydrogen bonding to occur. We also want to remember and consider the fact that anytime you have a linear or straight hydrogen bond where all of the atoms are in a straight linear orientation, that's going to be a stronger hydrogen bond than if we have all of the electronegative atoms not in a linear orientation, which is what we see here. So we have a little bit different angle going on. Instead of here, everything is in this nice linear orientation. So what are we going to consider as we're looking at water? We want to make sure we understand the hydrogen bonding between water molecules. We want to take a look at how polar molecules can readily dissolve in water. And honestly, more important, when we think about the human body, we really want to pay attention to how nonpolar molecules are going to interact with water because they can't dissolve in the water. And so we're going to really take some time looking at that hydrophobic effect. So let's review the structure of water. Shown here, we see the structure of water where we have the central oxygen atom bound to two hydrogen atoms and then we have two lone pair electrons. Now due to the strong field around these lone pair electrons, we end up with this distorted tetrahedron shape where the hydrogen atoms are gonna be pushed a little further away from those lone pairs. So in this orientation, the way it's shown from our text, the hydrogen atoms are sort of sticking out of the screen at you and the lone pair electrons are going into the screen away from you. Now because of these strong lone pair electrons, we get a net dipole moment that leads to a partial negative charge around these lone pair electrons. And due to this partial negative charge, our hydrogen atoms take on a partial positive charge. This gives water the ability to have both a hydrogen bond donor portion and a hydrogen bond acceptor portion. And so we want to look at how that's going to help us out. In your slideshow, I've also listed a few features that make water unique. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about all of these today, 
but just to give you a complete list of why water is so important to us as we study the human body. So, of course, we are going to spend some time talking about water's ability to hydrogen bond. And we're going to spend time talking about water's ability to really be the driving force for this hydrophobic effect. But all of these other properties of water make it very unique and critical to our survival. So let's look at how two water molecules can hydrogen bond together. So when we have a hydrogen molecule, we will have one area that serves as the proton acceptor, which was here. And then we'll have another water molecule serving as the proton donor, which is here. So we can form this hydrogen bond between two water molecules. Note that this hydrogen bond is actually much longer than a covalent bond, and that is really evidence that that hydrogen bond is weaker than a covalent bond. So I pose the question to you, why would we care so much about this hydrogen bonding? Why why would it be such an important bond if it's a weaker bond? The easiest way to answer that is to consider the fact that sometimes we need a weaker bond. We need molecules to have a bond that is strong enough to hold it together, but weak enough we can break it when we want to. So think about um, DNA, for example. DNA is hydrogen bound together by its nucleobases. Well, we want those bases to be able to come apart when we need to replicate DNA or when we need to transcribe DNA. So that weak bond, weaker bond is very important. So in this picture at the top, we can see two water molecules hydrogen bonding together. But if we consider one water molecule shown here, if we use both of the partial positively charged hydrogen atoms and our partially negative charged lone pairs, we can make a total of four hydrogen bonds to this one water molecule. Now in reality, we're going to have about 3.4 hydrogen bonds at any given time because the hydrogen bonds between your water molecules are constantly being made and being broken. It's not a static molecule. Things are going to be changing and moving around. So now let's look at water as a solvent. So water serves as a very good solvent for both charged and polar substances. So these are going to be things like our amino acids, peptides, alcohols, carbohydrates. So if we look down here in the picture, anything we see that has hydroxyl groups like glucose, carboxylic acid groups, amine groups, we're going to see this with our amino acids, our peptides, um, alcohols here, any of these are going to be polar and able to dissolve readily in water. What can't dissolve readily in water is going to be any of our nonpolar gases, anything aromatic. And if we look at our picture, this would be considered aromatic. And then anything with a long aliphatic chain, and that's shown here. So make sure you remember that this is not just a six carbon long hydro hydrocarbon chain, this is actually going to be more like 16 or 17 long, so just make sure you remember the nomenclature of how this is going to be written. And if we look at uh, charged ions or salts, they are going to be readily dissolved in water. So we can see if we take a sodium chloride salt, which is shown here in this nice little lattice work as a salt crystal, when it's exposed to water, it is going to lose some of that ordered structure, becoming much more disordered, which gives us a rise in entropy. And if you can think back to your Gen Chem 2 days, you can recall that is going to be the, the driving force that allows the water to dissolve these ions. So a quick aside, as we are trying to get into more of the thought of thinking about how things affect a human body, this ability to dissolve ions in water is pretty important to us. So this table here shows you some of the common ions that we have floating around inside of our body in different regions. 
but we don't just let them free flow. We actually sequester them into different body compartments, and, and you'll cover this a lot in your physiology classes. But from a biochemistry standpoint, we need to understand it's important that we have water available to dissolve these ions, so we don't want the ions to form a salt, because that's going to lead to crystalline solid formations in blood, lymph, in extracellular fluid. That could be a bad thing. So we actually keep things apart. So an example of that would be our calcium and phosphate. They're going to be kept completely separate because if they're allowed in too high of a quantity within the same compartment, then we're going to end up with calcium phosphate forming that is the solid. So other than hydrogen bonding and dissolving these um, polar solvents in water, we are going to see some non-covalent interactions that are important throughout this semester. Now the one we really want to pay attention to today is the hydrophobic effect. But just to be complete, let's make sure we recall there are other types of non-covalent interactions. We saw the ionic interaction some when we were looking at the ions dissolving in water. So an ionic interaction is going to be a interaction between two species that have a charge. A dipole interaction is going to be that same sort of interaction, but now we're looking at uncharged polar molecules. With Van der Waals interactions, those are going to be interactions between just atoms themselves, because all atoms have positive and negative charges because they're made of electrons and protons. If we get those charges too close together, there'll be some repulsion. If we get those atoms too far apart, then they lose some attraction. So with Van der Waals, we really want to think about just the nice interaction between the atoms. And then lastly, if we now, let's take a good look at the hydrophobic effect. So the hydrophobic effect really stems around how water orders around nonpolar substances. So we're not thinking about the water binding to the nonpolar hydrophobic molecule. We're really looking at how water hydrobonds to itself in an effort to get away from the hydrophobic molecule. And so just a little more information that you guys have in your slides. I'm going to let you read those to yourself about Van der Waals interactions hydrophobic effect here on this slide. I want to flip to this picture and make sure we can understand what the true driving force behind this hydrophobic effect is going to be. So when we take a look at this molecule here, it's got two main compartments. The top part, which I'm going to color in, that's the hydrophilic head group. So this is an amphipathic molecule a molecule that has a charged head that can interact with the water, the aqueous environment. So that's not really going to lead to any of the hydrophobic effect. But if we note here at the bottom, we have this long nonpolar region. The water can't interact with the hydrophobic portion. So the water begins to form this very highly ordered, what we call water cage, around the nonpolar region. So when we think about entropy, as the water begins to become more ordered, that's going to lower the entropy. So that's an unfavorable reaction. This, however, is the only option we have when we have this one hydrophobic molecule. But now let's think what's going to happen if I have more than one of these hydrophobic tails. Well, they're going to want to clump together. So let me grab my red pen here. So if we didn't have the hydrophobic molecules sticking together, we would begin to see more water molecules coming in between forming a water cage around each one, right? 
And so the more water we have interacting and forming more water cages, that's gonna make it less disordered, more ordered, lower entropy, not favorable. And so what we do inside of our body is we push these hydrophobic molecules close enough together that the water can't fit in between. And if the water can't fit in between, we have a smaller water cage just around the extreme periphery, the outside of those hydrophobic molecules, giving us more disorder, less order, so a increase in our entropy. So that's our hydrophobic effect. So now switching gears from just structural applications of water, let's start thinking about ionization of water. So when we consider the ionization of water, we're thinking about how a water molecule has the ability to dissociate into a proton and a hydroxide ion. So really quick um, chemistry review, grab a pen here. So if we think about our water molecule, we have oxygen, two lone pair electrons, and two hydrogens. Okay. I apologize, it's kind of ugly, but so we have our water. If this dissociates, it's going to dissociate into a proton or a hydrogen ion. That's the same thing. So what does this really mean? A hydrogen atom is one electron and one proton. So if we're dissociating, what we're doing is taking the electron away from that hydrogen atom, leaving us with just this proton, and then our hydroxide ion is going to be the oxygen with one hydrogen, those original two lone pair electrons, one electron that was bound to hydrogen, and then the other electron that we stole from the hydrogen atom. And so we got to have a negative charge. This is what our hydroxide is going to look like. So if we just start talking theory, water is capable of ionization. However, if we just have a beaker of water, it's not all going to magically turn into protons and hydroxide ions. This is a reversible pro process that is going to constantly be going back and forth, but this is kind of misleading. This arrow here should actually be much longer than the top arrow. The equilibrium really is going to strongly be pulled to the left. Also in reality, these protons are not very stable. So the protons don't hang out by themselves. We actually form hydronium ions, which is a water plus an extra proton. And so the way we're going to write or describe that hydronium ion, it's going to be this H30 or H3O, excuse me, plus. So that's a hydronium ion. We'll actually see that more in reality. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's the purpose of talking about this ionization of water? From the ionization of water, we can see that we will actually have an equilibrium constant. So an equilibrium constant is defined as the sum of the products over the sum of the reactants. And so for water, our equilibrium constant is going to be a, a pretty low number because we're going to tend to have more reactant than product. From doing some chemistry and looking at in a real situation at 25 degrees Celsius, we can figure out the equilibrium constant and we can also figure out the concentration of water. But more important to us as biochemists, we can figure out if we know the concentration of the sum of protons and hydroxide ions, and we know they have to be equal, then we can figure out in pure water what our concentration of proton and concentration of hydroxide ion are going to be. 
and it turns out it's 10 to the negative 7. You can also describe it as 1 times 10 to the negative 7. In order to make these numbers easier to work with, a long time ago, it was determined that if we used a logarithm scale to describe this concentration of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, it was much easier to work with. So it turns out in a pure solution of water, the concentration of protons is 10 to the negative 7. And if we take the negative log of 10 to the negative 7, we get a pH of 7. So this pH scale was, was really just a logarithmic scale des designed to describe the amount of protons that we have in a solution. And we consider water to be our, um, our point in which we measure everything else, and that's what we consider neutral on the scale. So in pure water, if we take the pH plus the pOH, so the concentration of hydrogen ions plus the concentration of hydroxide ions using the log scale, we see it's 14. So from this, we get our pH scale, where 7 is neutral. So in the human body, this is going to be things like blood, actually about 7.3, but very neutral. <clears throat> We also do have some portions where we're going to get up in the 8 range in the intestines. In the stomach, we get down here below 2. So we use this pH scale throughout our discussions of the human body. So can we do any math with these numbers? Well, we can if we know the concentration of protons or concentration of hydroxide ions, we can use the basic logarithmic scale here to determine a pH. Or vice versa, if we know the pH, we can use that to calculate our number of protons. What we're really going to do more, instead of looking just at pure water, we're going to pay more attention to a buffer. So now we want to continue this discussion and not just think about the dissociation of water, but we want to think about the dissociation of weak acids. So what makes something a weak acid versus a strong acid? So a strong acid completely dissociates. It's going to have an equilibrium constant that's very high or an acid dissociation constant that's very high. If we consider one of these weak acids, and in this example we have acetic acid, so here's our dissociation reaction. Our acid dissociation shows us that we're looking at the same thing, concentration of product over concentration of reactant. So the more dissociation, meaning the more we're pushing the equilibrium to the right, the higher the Ka, stronger the acid. So how can this be useful for us in a biochemistry course? So let's take a look at what's going on here with this acetic acid. So if we had this reaction at the top, let me get rid of this so we can draw on a little bit. So we consider the reaction here at the top. Let's say I were to add some sodium hydroxide into a solution of acetic acid. So some of this acetic acid in water will have dissociated. Well, let's say I add a small amount of hydroxide. What's this hydroxide going to do? The hydroxide is going to combine with any free protons that we have available, and that's going to form water. So if we add some water to this, is it really going to do a whole lot to this situation? Well, not immediately, right? But we know when we add hydroxide, if we add enough to any buffer, any weak acid, then 
we're going to increase the pH. So how are we going to increase the pH by adding sodium hydroxide? So what we've done is we've pulled some of these protons away. That's going to drive our equilibrium to the right to try to make up for what we've stolen here from the right side of the equation. Taking more of this acid away, pH is going to go up. So now let's do the reverse. Grab my eraser here. All right. So now let's do the opposite. Let's say we're going to add some acid. So we've got eight hydrochloric acid. It doesn't matter. We're adding some strong acid, so we've got some protons. Well, this strong acid is going to combine with any free hydroxide that we have because this is a water-based system. It will have some hydroxide from the dissociation of water. But we can also get some of this proton will combine with the conjugate base acetate, forming more of the acid. So that's pulling the equilibrium this direction. We're going to make more water, we're going to have more acid available, and we just keep driving the equilibrium. More acid available, more protons available, we're lowering the pH. So we're going to keep that in mind as we keep discussing. So let's play around with the math just a little, and let's consider working with this acid dissociation constant. So if we wanted to kind of think about what would our pH be if we had acetic acid, and we, come, we have 0.1 moles in this example of acetic acid. So 0.1 moles of acetic acid and we're adding a bunch of water. So as we begin to add the water, we will see some dissociation. So a certain amount of acetic acid is going to be dissociated. So whatever amount of acetic acid we lose, we make that amount of acetate and that amount of proton. If we work out the acid dissociation constant, we can figure out the amount of proton. And then to figure out pH, we take the negative log of this proton concentration, we get the pH. This is actually quite complex math. You have to use the quadratic equation. So it turns out when we're considering these weak acids, it's really such a small amount that you lose from the 0.1 moles of acetate that you can actually just ignore that minus x on the bottom of your acid dissociation constant, solving for proton concentration, and notice you actually get a pretty similar pH. So you can simplify those types of uh, math problems. Just like with our proton concentrations, when we're looking at acid dissociation constants, those numbers are kind of ugly numbers to work with. Those 10 to the negative 3, 10 to the negative 7. So we also use a logarithmic scale to describe our acid dissociation constant. By taking the negative log of the Ka, we can look at pKa's. So remember this is going to be an inverse relationship. So if we have a very high Ka giving us a strong acid, that's going to be equivalent to a very small pKa, giving us the stronger acid. What allows these weak acids to form a buffer is the fact that with a weak acid and you begin to get some dissociation, what you end up with is a mixture of acid to conjugate base. And so this just allows us to add small amounts of hydroxide and strong amounts of proton and see a, a resistance to change in pH. So any amount of hydroxide we add, we're going to steal some protons and make some water. We'll have some acetate, but that's okay. Any amount of proton that we have can combine with our acetate, forming more acid. So we just kind of have this constant cycling between acid, conjugate base, that allows us to resist the pH change. I personally think this is easier to observe if we take a look at this titration curve. 
So notice on the titration curve, our axis at the bottom is amount of hydroxide added. So it should make sense that as we increase the amount of hydroxide, we're going to see an increase in pH. But with weak acids, we don't see a perfectly linear relationship like this. Instead, what we see is this sigmoid curve. So initially, at very low amounts of hydroxide present, we're going to predominantly see mainly acids. We're going to see mainly acetic acid. But as we continue to add hydroxide, we're going to approach this inflection point in the curve where we have equal amounts of acid and conjugate base in the system. So we have forced a half of this acid to ionize into proton and conjugate base. So at this point, this is where our pH is going to be equal to our pKa, and this is the absolute best buffering region. Because we have acid, we have acid to handle any hydroxide that comes in, and we have conjugate base to handle any proton that we are exposed to. And so the best buffering region is anywhere within plus one to minus one pH range of this pKa. Anywhere in here, we're going to have enough acid and enough conjugate base to resist pH change. And we see a trend like this with all of our weak acids. We are going to encounter weak acids throughout this course as we discuss the human body. So we are going to play with one of these weak acid buffering systems today and understand how this allows us to buffer our blood. So I did provide for you a list of many of the metabolic acids that we're going to play with throughout this semester. So carbonic acid we'll work with today. It's um, conjugate basis by carbonate. Lactic acid, pyruvic acid, citric acid. These we're going to play with as we move into our discussion of metabolism in the next trimester. Also, these two they are going to be some of our ketones. That's going to be part of our discussion as we are in metabolism. I did want to go ahead and point out to you today in this lecture that phosphoric acid is an incredibly important buffering system that you will need to pay special attention to. It's a very important molecule when we think of the human body. For one reason, it's going to have negative charges around the pH of 7, which is neutral most places in the human body, so it's very important for us. But I strongly recommend that you go ahead and try to, on your own, draw a titration curve for phosphoric acid. Really think about what's going on as I have multiple protons to remove, I have multiple pKa's, so that's a very good homework assignment for you guys to sit down and make sure you can understand. So lastly here, there, there is some math that you can do, and we're going to do this using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Now we're not going to spend a ton of time in this particular class going through pH equations and pH, re, um, pH problems, but I do have some practice problems for you that I highly recommend you work through and we'll go through those in class together. But we get this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation from some math looking at the acid dissociation constant and, you know, deriving this equation. So our last discussion that we need to have together today is looking at actually using one of these biological buffering systems. So in our biological buffering systems, we're going to have the ability to maintain a specific pH by incorporating a weak acid and a conjugate base into different areas within the body. So our most common we'll see used in the human body are going to be phosphate buffering systems, histidine, as well as other side chain amino acids other than histidine. We're going to see these throughout the course. 
But today, I want to focus on the bicarbonate buffering system. So this does require a little bit of a physiological discussion. And I, I'm going to escape out of the PowerPoint for just a moment so that I can show you guys what I would actually be writing on the board in this situation. All right. So let's think about how we can buffer using the bicarbonic acid buffering system. Okay. So let me grab one more PowerPoint slide just because my writing abilities on this screen are not always the best. So if we take a look here, this is the reaction that occurs within your blood giving us the bicarbonate buffering system. So in your blood, you are going to have a certain pressure of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will combine with water, actually under the action of an enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, to produce carbonic acid. And this is our weak acid that will then dissociate to produce a proton and a bicarbonate ion. So if you'll note here at the bottom, this is the equation we would use for that Henderson-Hasselbalch equation with how we would calculate pHs using bicarbonate. And actually, instead of carbonic acid, you use pressure of carbon dioxide. That's what we're able to really control. So let's take a look at some how normally we would use this buffering system in the body. So we can change the pH by looking at respiration rates and by looking at the function of the kidney. So let's say we're under normal physiological conditions, nothing crazy going on, but we do have something occurring that gives us a slight increase in blood pH. So how is the body going to respond to that? The body is then going to decrease the respiration rate. Okay. So physiology-wise, what does that mean? If we're slowing down our respiration, what we're doing is keeping more carbon dioxide. So how does our buffering system do this? So remember, our blood pH was kind of high, so we're trying to lower it. To do this, we keep more CO2 more CO2 means the equilibrium shifts to the right. We form more carbonic acid, resulting in higher amounts of free proton. We fixed our issue using our buffering system in the blood. High pH, we keep more CO2, drive the equilibrium to the right, more acid, lowered the pH, fixed the problem. So let's look at the opposite. What if we have a slight decrease in our blood pH? Well, we can fix it. The way we would fix it, or one way we would fix it, is we would increase our rate of respiration without even knowing we've done this. Increased respiration allows us to get rid of CO2. That's going to drive our equilibrium here to the left. Because we've lost CO2, we need to produce more. We decreased our pressure of CO2. So we're going to take more of our acid, release it in the form of CO2. Less acid, less proton, increase our pH. And that's what we were trying to do because our original problem was that our pH was going down a little bit too much. So now let's take a look at how else we can fix these problems without leading to true metabolic end issues. Your kidneys can also help you with this. Well, anytime you need to, your kidneys can increase secretion of bicarbonate or increase retention of protons. Both of these will help you lower your pH. So if you had something going on that was leading to an increase in pH, not only would your lungs start working, to help you decrease the pH, but your kidneys can help you decrease the pH by doing this. The reverse is also true. 
if something's going on that's got your pH too low, well, your kidneys are going to start secreting more proton, retain, retaining more of this bicarbonate, helping you fight off this problem. So this is just how we're using um, this buffering system in the blood. Now, can issues occur? Well, they certainly can occur. And if issues occur and we end up with too low or too high of a pH, we can end up with an acidosis or an alkalosis. So if we have a decrease in our blood bicarbonate with too much decrease, that's a metabolic acidosis. If we end up with an incredibly high pressure of carbon dioxide, that's a respiratory acidosis. If we end up with a very high blood bicarb level, that's a metabolic alkalosis. If we end up with a very low carbon dioxide pressure, that's a respiratory alkalosis. So what are some metabolic conditions that can lead to this, or some disease states, some, some alterations that can lead to acidosis and alkalosis. So let's think about this excessive amounts of carbon dioxide in the blood. What are some things that can cause this? Well, what if we have a impaired lung function? So our lungs aren't giving us proper gas exchange. Or maybe we have emphysema. We have bronchitis, um, obesity. So, so something that's causing us not to be able to get rid of our CO2. So we've got too much CO2. So think back, high levels of CO2, that's going to push us to go more towards that right of the equation. So we're keeping more CO2. That's going to lead to an acidosis. Well, what if we are hyperventilating, that's going to be the opposite. Hyperventilation means we're getting rid of all of our CO2. We're forcefully expelling that CO2 when we don't want to. So we don't have enough CO2. Hyperventilation can lead to a respiratory alkalosis. Things like diarrhea, that can also have an effect because we'll lose too much bicarbonate. That can lead to an acidosis. If um, excessive ingestion of alcohol leads to too many alcohol-related breakdown components in our blood, that can lead to an acidosis. Uh, starvation untreated diabetes that can lead to high levels of ketones which are acids in our blood pushing this buffering system to its limits and we end up with an acidosis um, also you know some newer fad diets are leading to much lower ingestions of sugars high levels of breakdown of fats that can also lead to an acidosis so what i really want the takeaway to be from this discussion of acidosis and alkalosis is how can we use this buffering system we have in the blood to keep us from going into a state of acidosis and alkalosis and how can we really monitor these slight changes in pH simply altering the levels of CO2 and bicarbonate that we have to really keep these things under control.